Okay. Good morning. Good morning. How is everybody? Cold. Okay, I just want to send a word of encouragement real quick. I saw clouds coming up over the mountains. I'm a massive fan of winter and snow, <laughs> and this is encouragement to me. And if I say it's going to snow, I think I'm just going to get stoned up here and um, sent out of the building. Hey, we're not so, praying for snow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I am, but who here is ready for snow? <laughs> well, you're an enthusiast. Um, all right, so... Uh, welcome, everyone, to the second service. Phil is not here today. Um, he and his wife, Chris, are at a pastor's conference in California, and that's good because we want our pastor to be refreshed. Um, when he comes back, we want him to be renewed um, and energized again to, to teach from the word, um, and it's, it's good for our pastor to be spiritually healthy, and so um, it is good right now that he's taken a little bit of a break. Today, we're going to have Elder Bob share. Um, the word, um, but for announcements and, well, for a greeting, at least right now, it's going to be one of us two, just because he needs to save his voice. Um, so as people are still coming in, I think we'll usually have a few that come in still after we start. Um, if you have some empty seats near you, please just uh, make, make it available so that they can sit down. And um, yeah, so I can't hear you. Yeah, I'd like to throw in one. Uh, we've got a, we did, had pastor appreciation, and there's a card circulating around. Uh, people are signing for, you know, just say hi to Phil, and uh, we'll present him with uh, the money we collected next week. And uh, anyway, if you can see that card floating around, why don't you just sign it? He, lo he loves to, he'll love to get all that encouragement. Thank you. All right, um, we are going to begin with Jabin leading us in a word of prayer, and uh, we'll go from there. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for just this place to worship you and um, just this body of believers who come to seek your face and to um, just want to grow closer to know you better. And God, thank you for, um, and thank you for Pastor Phil, who's gone right now, who is um, just such a good steward of this church. And we just ask that you... Um, Bless him and, and uh, his wife, Chris, and just encourage them and refresh them and, and renew their spirits, Lord. And God, help us now to just grow deeper with you and um, just draw us closer to your spirit. God, we thank you for your love and your mercy and thank you for what you did on the cross. And uh, We just want to be your humble servants today and worship you and, and praise you and um, just to sing out to you, Lord. We just want to give it all to you now. So just lead us into truth today. Be with Pastor Baum. Uh, keep his voice uh, strong. And um, yeah, let's just worship now, God. And we just want to give this all to you in Jesus' name. All right, well, you can stand or sit. Um, what matters is the, the attitude of your heart. So Garrett and I are going to lead you in a little worship. And, and uh, we're just going to seek the Lord's face. this world fade away Jesus you are my reward to hear your voice on that day is all I'm living for yes God Jesus you are my
I want to hear you say the words to me, well done. And I want to hear you say, good and faithful servant. And I want to hear you say, I've prepared a place for you. Lord, let all the treasures of this world fade away. Jesus, you are my reward. To hear your voice on that day is all I'm living for. Jesus, you are my all I'm living for is God. In the twinkling of an eye, we'll all be changed. We'll meet you in the sky. We will see you face to face. us to live for you and just to worship you and just to constantly seek after your face, Lord. You give life.
you give life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great. your breath. Sing it. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we time sing it out all is stripped away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's a word that will bless your heart I'll 
bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for the thing I made it and it's all about you it's all about you, Jesus. King of endless words, no one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single breath. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus Sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry.
Dear God, thank you for this time of worship. Just be with our devotional teaching now as uh, Bill comes up and teaches from your word, Lord. Just, Father, bless him. Just pray in your name. You can be seated for devotional time now. Good morning. Lots of smiling faces out there. Guess what I just saw? Little white particles falling out of the sky. What? Not many. But it's that time of year, you know. I guess if we choose to live in the basin, we just have to endure. Got to get my cheaters on. <clears throat> Part of getting up in age, you know, you have little things, but I read a quotation one time that said, I don't mind getting old because I know a lot of people that won't have that privilege. But if we trust in the Lord, everything will be okay. We kind of live in a I guess a decaying world now with everything that's going on in the world. You know, the hate, the discontent. Whatever happened to compassion? Doesn't seem like there's much of that around anymore. Lamentations 332. Though he brings grief, he also shows compassion because of the greatness of his unfailing love. Compassion is a feeling of something, of wanting to help someone, sympathetic consciousness of others, of others' distress together with a desire to alleviate it. Literally a feeling with and for others is a fundamental and distinctive quality of the biblical concept of God. 1 Peter 3.8, finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic, love all brothers, be compassionate and humble. In Jesus Christ, in whom God was manifested in the flesh, compassion was an outstanding feature. Matthew 9.36, but seeing the crowds, he was moved with compassion on them because they were tired and scattered like sheep with no shepherd. Matthew 14, 14. And Jesus went out and saw a great crowd, and he was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. We need more compassion. And he, Jesus, taught that it ought to be extended not to friends and neighbors only, but to all without exception, even to enemies. Romans 9, 15, for God said to Moses, I will show mercy to anyone I choose, and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. Matthew 5, 43 to 45, we have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who disrespectfully use you and persecute you, so that you may become sons of your Father in heaven. For he made his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and send rain, sends rain on the just and unjust. The God of the New Testament, the Father of men, is most clearly revealed as a God full of compassion. It extends to the whole human race for which he effected not, <clears throat> not mercy, a temporal, but a spiritual and eternal deliverance, giving up his only son to the death on the cross in order to save us from the worst bondage of sin with its consequences. 
seeking thereby to gain a new wider people for himself, still more devoted and filled with the expression of his own spirit. Therefore, all who know God our Father of Christ and who call themselves his children must necessarily cultivate compassion and show mercy even as he is merciful. Lamentations 3.22 The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never seep because his compassions fail not. Compassion. Something we all need. But let us pray. Father, as we come before you this day, Father, we give thanks for this place that we might worship, for the congregation who comes to open their hearts and minds to you, Father. We pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit will enter each and every one of us and fill us with love, devotion, and compassion, Father, compassion that we all need so that we can show others that you are a one and true loving God and that your love never ends. We pray for Pastor Phil <clears throat> and Chris, Father, as Phil attends the pastor conference in California. We pray, Father, that he is uplifted and that comes back with more stories to share and with a livelier step in his fate. We just pray for their safety, and we pray, Father, that you work in their hearts and minds as you always have. We pray for our first responders. Keep them safe, Father. Those who go out and daily expose themselves to harm in order to protect us. We pray for our governments, Father, on the national, state, and local levels. We just pray, Father, that they all seek your face and that you are very important in the decisions that they make, that you guide and direct them in everything that they do, Father. We just thank you, Father, for those that are here and for those who are not. We know some are hurting. We know some that just need your love, need your tender touch. So just touch them, Father, whether they are with us today or are not. We just pray for them all, Father, that you give them healing, that you give them love, that you give them comfort, understanding, and strength. We just pray now for Elder Bob, Father, as he comes to deliver the message, Father. We pray that his words are your words, that you guide him through this teaching, Father, and that our hearts and minds will be open to the words that he speaks, for we know that they come from you, Father. So we just give it all to you, Father. We lay it at the foot of the cross. And we pray in Jesus' most precious and awesome name. Amen. The pastor appreciation card is back on the desk, on the table back there for anyone who hasn't signed it. No, it's not. I have announcements. He doesn't like when I have announcements. Oh, that's okay. Um, so just real quick, uh, let's see. This is next Monday, correct? Next Monday, yes, November 13th. Okay. There is a concert, um, Stars Go Dim, um, over in Roosevelt. They're going to be here, which is awesome. Um, they're on, which what station is it? Caleb and Key Radio and stuff. If you ever listen, you'll hear these guys. Um, they're a really good band. So I think the youth, we're going to try and take a group that is unofficial at this point. So any youth in here that want to go, um, please come talk to me afterwards. I'll be out here. Um, we're trying to figure out how we're going to organize that. But um, we encourage everyone, um, whoever wants to go or you want to find out more, please look them up. Stars Go Dim, they're really good. Um, and we just, we'd like to pack the house if we can. So we have some of these hanging up, um, actually, I think at, uh, most of the fellowships in Vernal and Roosevelt and possibly Duchesne. So, anyways, we encourage that. It's next Monday. Also, for the youth, um, thank you for any of the youth who came to the Progressive Dinner on Friday. Um, we had a blast. I thought it was great. We had about, th well, we started with 28, and then we went to 32, and then we just kept on progressing as we got to each house. 
Um, and it was a lot of fun. Um, so if you were in here, uh, one of the youth, and you have not um, been a part of any of our youth activities, we encourage you to join us. We have Wednesday night youth group, 6th through 8th grade, and high school youth group. Um, it's Wednesday night at 6.30 here at the church. Um, it is a lot of fun. We have a blast. And we have other events coming up, but you have to go to youth group to hear most of those. Sometimes we'll make announcements on Sunday, so. So um, if you are a parent and you are interested in your kid or um, someone that you know getting involved in youth ministry, please come and talk to us. Um, we'd love to, you know, hook you guys up and um, introduce your kids to the, the people who come to the youth group and um, kind of get to know us. So I think that is all I have. Is Kay. that all I have? That's all I have. Okay. That's all, that's all you've got. <laughs> oh, and... Um, Here's Jenna right here. Jenna, okay, for those of you who don't know, Jenna Loss and her husband Travis were our previous high school youth leaders. Um, they live in Washington now, and Bill and Janet Zenner are here taking over, um, and they've been doing a fantastic job. Thank you. Um, but Jenna is visiting, so we also would just want to say hello to her. So if you know her, please stop her before she leaves church. All right. <laughs> and that's all I got. been letting uh, Garrett and everybody do the praying and the announcements is my voice was started to wane by the end of the first service so I'm going to try to make it through the second service I got my cough drops in my throat spray and uh, but first we've got a little video clip for Operation Christmas Child and we're going to show that right now and then uh, we'll let Tanya say a word On November 8, 2013, the face of a nation was changed forever. One of the largest storms mankind has ever witnessed brought widespread devastation across central Philippines. Samaritan's Purse responded immediately with relief supplies and sought to bring joy and love to children through Operation Christmas Child by sending 65,000 shoebox gifts from victims of Hurricane Sandy. This is a story of a journey, one woman's venture into a region ravaged by tragedy and yet graced by the love and compassion of a simple gift. I'm Zoyne Samar and I'm from Manila. When I was 14 years old, I was a recipient of Operation Christmas Child, a shoebox. And that day, I learned that someone is praying for me all I know is her name is Ashley. Merry Christmas, Ian. That created impact in my life because it opens a door for me to share God's love to others. Joyce and Anna are volunteers with Operation Christmas Child, traveling with teams to deliver these gifts. Their travels first led them from lush mountainscapes to the devastated tropical island of Bantayan. It was really shocking for me to see the, the lives of the people right now here. I've never seen a place like this before. You don't know how to go back to a normal life after this. When I heard that Operation Christmas Child will be able to send shoe boxes here in this island, it's like an awesome thing that they will be able to experience. We're on our way to a church where Samaritan Spurs has been helping, and we're going to give shoe boxes. This is our first experience having the Operation Christmas Child giving gifts to the children. The kids are so excited to open their boxes. I remember receiving shoe boxes. The smile in his face, I wear that before. Together with the shoebox, we also offer the greatest gift. It's a colored booklet with us about Jesus, that the shoebox gift is not only about a gift, but also learning who God is. I know it's not an accident. Next, the team arrived in Tacloban, a city still digging out of debris. During the typhoon, a wall of water between 15 and 20 feet high inundated this area, washing away homes and entire livelihoods. For the children here, the emotional wounds still have not healed. 
when I came here in this place, I really want to back out. I really want to to go home and cry. I'm just thinking, how can I help them in my own ways? It's really hard seeing these children experience this kind of tragedy and I don't know how they will come up and overcome these feelings. I remember Saturday after the typhoon, everybody is down rather than making a long face. Now you can see smiles again and I am very happy about that. Our children actually are so excited to receive these gifts. It would really uh, help a lot, and not only to their children, but also to the whole family, actually. I told them, I said, you know, the Lord our God is going to bless you today. Huh? He gives you a beautiful gift, packed together in a box for you by a family who loves you. It means a lot for them, because they thought that they will never receive any gift this year. But here comes the Operation Christmas child giving them gifts. And not just the gift, a hope and a joy, a relationship with God. As the team is leaving, more and more signs of recovery could be seen across the countryside. Rebuilding, sharing, playing. These are the signs of resiliency, of love and hope maybe even joy. Hello? Hello. Okay. <laughs> I'm not my sister, so I don't know how these things work. <laughs> so we're coming to the close of Operation Christmas Child. Our final weeks are coming upon us. Our push is November 13th through the 19th. So if you haven't had an opportunity to grab a box or to go to one of our local stores and grab one of the plastic boxes that are about the size of a shoe box, I really encourage you to take the time to participate in this particular outreach. As you can tell, it makes a huge difference in a child's life, but not only that child's life, but a lot of times the entire community can be um, changed by the simple gift of the shoebox because they're also being witnessed to and discipled to through the um, program that Operation Christmas Child gives them. This video particularly spoke to me because of her saying, you can't go to there and, uh, and not be changed. Um, so I'm sorry. Um, a few years ago, I got to go to Guatemala. And I didn't do this in the first service. But um, it took several months after I got back from Guatemala to be able to even uh, sit in my house and sit at the table and not feel just okay with it because you're, we're so abundantly blessed in the United States just to have our homes and to have food and be able to go to the store and to be able to open our Bibles and to come and worship. And when I sit at home and I screen these videos to bring them and to share them with you, my husband's like, Tanya, you know, that's enough because I just sit there and cry because they touch my heart so much, these children and their hope of what they endure, you know, in their daily lives because we're so blessed. So I would just encourage you to um, search your heart and think about participating because just the simple gift of one shoe ox with what it contains with the little booklet can really change an entire community and their eternal salvation. So just take that home with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. It really is a great thing. I, l I love doing, going and getting Christmas. I always uh, just imagine what, uh, what it would be like for those kids when they open these things. But it's pretty cool. Okay, let's dismiss the kids. They're going to their prospective classes.
got a message I think you guys will really like today. We're going to talk about miracles in the Bible. When we read through the Bible, you see it from beginning to end, you, you see all these supernatural events, miracles happening that have, of course, no natural explanation except to call them miracles. Miracles were performed by God uh, through the prophets uh, in the Old Testament. And, of course, Jesus performed miracles to establish his Messiahship when he came. And then you see after him the apostles performing miracles as a way to establish their credentials. And then uh, you see uh, not much happening after the close of the Bible. Once we had the completed completed Bible. And uh, and then, of course, we could get the book of Revelation, uh, the end times, you see uh, the Holy Spirit will be removed and then Satan will gear up and be performing miracles through his Antichrist, trying to establish him as the Messiah, and God will be uh, intervening. So, uh, at any rate, but they've they got this gap in between where they see all the miracles in the Old and the New Testament, then you see it in the book of Revelation, and we're in between, and, not, and you don't see miracles that much today. And it was some, I can just think some people saying, wow, we get chipped. Well, no, I'm going to explain this here in a little bit. Or we actually got a much better deal. We're going to touch on all these, but the main focus of what I'm going to will be on three miracles that Jesus performed. They were called Messianic miracles. And I'm going to have to depend on throat spray. Mm. and cough drops to get through this. For starters, miracles were never done just to show off. The every last one from beginning to end has very specific purpose, and sometimes the purpose has changed. So, what we find is prior to the coming of Yeshua, Jesus, the ancient rabbis separated miracles into two categories. The first were miracles that anybody could perform if they were empowered by God through the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're going to look at some examples, like Moses, for instance, performed miracles. The second categories of miracles were miracles, were called messianic miracles, which were miracles the rabbis had determined that only the Messiah was going to be able to perform. Jesus, of course, did miracles in both categories. And we're about to see there's a totally different reaction uh, when, they, when he did what was deemed the messianic miracles. Jesus' first miracle that he performed, a public miracle, was turning water into wine. And uh, what was the reaction to the people? It's like, hey, cool, Jesus' life of the party. You know, they, they took it in stride. And by, uh, by the way, he didn't just turn a couple bottles. Uh, by best estimates, it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 160 gallons of fine wine. Must have been some party. But after that, he goes and he heals a leper. And whoa, totally, totally different reaction. Stopped the presses. The word went all over Israel. Why? I'm going to back up for a second. I'm going to go into Exodus chapter 7. By the way, I'm reading in the, uh, out of the New King James today. Uh, and so if you don't have that, you might want to, we should have the New King James up on the board. I'm going to ch Exodus chapter 7, starting in verse 8. I'm going to illustrate a principle for you. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh speaks to you, saying, Show a miracle for yourselves, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and let it become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh. They did so just as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. But Pharaoh called the wise men of, uh, and the sorcerers, and so the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For every man threw down his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods, and Pharaoh's heart grew hard, 
and he did not heed them as the Lord had said. All right, what's the principle here? The principle is there are two sources of, of spiritual power in this world. You've got God and you've got Satan. Satan's power, of course, is limited by God. And it's being severely restricted today by the Holy Spirit. Today, God doesn't use miracles as much as he did prior to the completion of the Bible. See, miracles had a purpose. Miracles were there to establish the identity of the prophets of God. You know, before, they, uh, before like in the Old Testament times, someone would come up to a group of people and say, I'm a prophet of God. I'm here to give you the word of the Lord. How do you know? So what God did was he gave these people the, the ability to perform miracles and to give prophecies. They would give prophecies. And by the way, if someone came and says, uh, I've got the word of the Lord and gave a prophecy and it didn't come true, what happened to him? He got stoned. So they didn't take these things lightly. So at any rate, uh, these, these guys would come and they would give a prophecy or could perform a miracle. In the New Testament times, you've got Jesus. He used miracles to establish his Messiahship. After Jesus, you've got the apostles, like Peter, James, and John, uh, had the ability to perform miracles to establish their apostleship. But with the close of the Bible, all of a sudden you don't see these things happening much anymore. Why? Well, we've got the Bible now. There are no more prophets. There are no more apostles. My apologies to the Pope who thinks he's an apostle. There are no more apostles. There are no more prophets today. So we don't need people performing miracles to establish their credentials. And that's why you did not see miracles like you did back then. We have a much better deal. I mentioned that. We've got a better deal. We've got the Bible. Think about that. Back in those days, you had to stand around and wait for an apostle or, or a prophet or someone to come up and give you the word of the Lord and prove it and go through all, the, all that rigmarole. We don't need that anymore today. We've got the word of the Lord complete and ready to go at our fingertips anytime we want. Now that's a better deal. Amen? Amen. So today we see very true, we see very few true miracles of God. Now I will admit that if they do happen on occasion, we've had a couple of people here that have witnessed bona fide miracles. And we've also uh, had people here that have been witness uh, occasional manifestations of the demonic realm. They happen. If you ever do witness a bona fide miracle, the first thing that should, you should come into your mind and the first question you should ask is, who's the source of, who's the power behind this miracle? Because that will tell you everything about whether, uh, what it's about. All right. With that in mind, we're going to look at the first of the Messianic miracles. The first Messianic miracle was the healing of a leper. Under the Mosaic law, the only time it was possible for a person to be defiled by a living body was if he touched a leper. Normally under Mosaic law, one could only be defiled if they touched a dead human body or if they touched a dead animal body or if they touched a live, unclean animal like a pig. From the time the Mosaic Law was completed, there was no record of any Jew being healed of leprosy. There were two cases of, of leprosy uh, healings in the Old Testament. One was Miriam, and she was healed, but that was before the completion of the law. And Naaman was healed of leprosy, but he was a Gentile, not a Jew. There was no natural cure for leprosy whatsoever. Yet, in Leviticus, there are, there are detailed instructions as to what to do if someone should come forward and claim to be healed of leprosy. First, they did an offering of two birds. Then, for the next seven days, the uh, rabbis would uh, do a complete investigation to validate validi Validate, <laughs> validate the claim. 
if after seven days it was determined that a person really was cured of leprosy, then there was another series of offerings and rituals. I mean, they were a bit, it was a very big deal. And it became widely taught that only Messiah would be able to do this miracle. Three of the Gospels tell us about Jesus' healing of a leper. Matthew 8, 24, Mark 1, uh, 40 through 45, and Luke 5, 12 through 16. We're going to use Luke's account because he does give a little more detail. So Luke chapter 5, starting verse 12. And it happened when he was in a certain city that, behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus, and he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then he put his hand, put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy fell, left him, and he charged him, now this is interesting, he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priests and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them as Moses had commanded. A couple of things here. First off, we see that the, that the man recognized Jesus' authority to heal him. He called him Lord, and he said, if you are willing. And notice that the healing was complete and it was instantaneous. I'm going to just jump out for a second and mention the, the, the miracle healings and the, and the tongues and stuff you see on TV. Uh, basically, that stuff's all just, it's a show. It's phony. Don't, please don't ever get wrapped up into that Benny Hinn stuff, slang in the spirit, knocking people down. It's, uh, it's embarrassing. But note what Jesus told the leper to do. In verse 14, he instructs the man to go directly to the leadership of Israel and to begin the, in the investigation as commanded in Leviticus. And for the next seven days, the leadership will verify that the man was, one, full of leprosy, two, that he was healed, and three, that Jesus is the one that healed him. So the word went out all over Israel, and uh, the rabbis all got, got real excited, and the Sanhedrin got together, and they said, Shazam, the Messiah has arrived. Let the party begin, right? No. At this point, their response actually was the proper thing to do. And reading in, we're going to read out in verses uh, 17 through 26. Now it happened on a certain day, as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the law, the Lord, was, uh, he was uh, present to heal them. Then behold, men brought a man on a bed, a, a, on a bed, a man who was paralyzed, whom they had sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find out find out how they might bring him in because of the crowd they went up on the housetop and led him down with his bed through the tiling in the midst before Jesus when he saw their faith he said to this to him man your sins are forgiven you and the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason saying who is this who speaks blasphemies who can forgive sins but God alone but when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to, him, to them, you are re Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven you, or rise up and walk. But that you may know the Son of Man has power on earth to, to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, departed to his own house, glorifying God. 
and they were all amazed. They were glo- and they glorified God and, and uh, were filled with fear, saying, we have seen a strange thing today. Why are all these Jewish leaders suddenly having a convention in Capernaum? They came from all over Israel. They knew, they had heard that Jesus had healed a leper, and according to their own teachings, only Messiah would be able to do this miracle. So they came to investigate him. According to Sanhedrin law, they were to investigate Messianic claims in two stages. The first stage was observation, during which they were not allowed to ask questions. They were just to watch. And see, that's what they're doing here. You see, they're they're sitting around, and uh, and you get the picture of the crowd around the door. These uh, they're when these guys dig through the roof and let down the paralyzed man. You notice at this point, the leaders are keeping their objections to themselves. Jesus, of course, sees right through them. The Jewish leadership of Israel is already making and forming their opinion of Jesus as he performs yet another miracle right in front of their eyes. Favorite principle coming. You guys guys have been around for a while. I've heard me talk about this one before. Arrogance makes normally smart people stupid. I'm going to repeat it. Arrogance makes normally smart people stupid. For whatever reason, arrogance is this great blinder that comes down and it just uh, it diminishes your, uh, your ability to see and to think. I don't know why. See, the Jews had a real problem on their hand. If they believed their own scripture, they were waiting for the Messiah. They'd been waiting for this Messiah for 2,000 years. They'd been waiting for him and expecting him to come at any moment. But the same scriptures that they read that told them to wait for the Messiah also told them that when he comes, they're going to reject him. I'm going to demonstrate this, uh, this dilemma. I'm going to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is a famous chapter concerning the coming Messiah. We'll start from read verses 1 through 5. Who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he, sh- for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. You know, you and I can read this and it's so obvious. Even if you're not a believer in in Jesus Christ, you can look at this and know that's who they're talking about. Well, okay, you think, well, why don't the Jews read that and they'd understand? Well, there's that blindness again. But you know that they've got to deal with this some way or another, right? So how do they deal with this chapter today? They simply look at this chapter and they say, well, this is talking about Israel. It doesn't fit. It doesn't work. It makes no sense whatsoever. But there you go. Let's see, where are we? Ah, Jesus. At this point, you're going to love this. It's kind of like Jesus' sense of humor. He's really going to force their hands. But before he heals the man, he makes this announcement. You know, this is, this is the tweak that Jesus gives to him that really gets him. In Luke 5.20, Jesus, where it says, Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Man, your sins are forgiven. 
this makes all the leaders sit around these guys, that makes their heads explode. They are there to investigate a messianic miracle. Jesus has just performed yet another miracle right in front of them. And when Jesus makes this declaration of forgiveness, which is perfectly acceptable for the Messiah to do, we see that the leaders have already made up their minds to reject Jesus. It's that blinding again. At this point, the investigation enters the second phase. The first phase was observation. Now comes the interrogation. See, from this point on, everywhere that Jesus went, a Pharisee was sure to follow. Kind of reminds me of Mary had a little lamb. Everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Everywhere that Jesus went, the lamb was sure to follow. And this time, they were no longer silent. They were there. They were asking questions. They are raising objections and trying their best to turn everyone against their Israel's deliverer. It's a good thing that I wasn't Messiah sitting there. I'd have been Father, smite, please. I mean, I think the rest of us would not be so patient. I want to take a minute, and I want to really give you something that should strengthen your faith in Jesus. See, when you're going through these accounts, over the centuries, skeptics have poured over these accounts of this interaction between Jesus and the Jewish leadership. And there's one thing that comes up that has led many a skeptic to faith. Never once do you read that the enemies of Christ ever denied that he actually did the miracles. Think about that. No one ever denied or tried to accuse him that he actually didn't do the miracles, that he faked them somehow. They uh, tried to explain them away. Um, they tried to prove otherwise. And as we're about to see, they actually get to the point of accusing him of demonism. But nobody could ever come forth and say he didn't do them because there's too many witnesses. So basically what you've got here is you've got really strong evidence from the mouth of the enemies. You like that? I think that's pretty cool. Now, I'm going to get into the source, the source of the conflict between the Jews and, and uh, Jesus. See, what's the source of this rub? Why did they reject him when he was doing what he was supposed to do? Well, the problem was is that over the centuries, since the giving of the law, the law of Moses, see, uh, the law of Moses contained about 633 laws, and uh, which is plenty. But the uh, Jewish leadership wasn't happy with that. They started adding over the centuries. They kept adding and adding and adding hundreds and hundreds of extra laws to the law of Moses. They got to the point where they had upwards of 1,500 extra laws just for the Sabbath alone. They perverted the law of Moses into this ridiculous monster. You know, it reminds me of our government. Any government bureaucrat would be proud of what they did. <laughs> For instance, I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, the law, just working on, working on the Sabbath. It got to the point where they included carrying anything heavier than a quill, which was their version of an ink pen at the time. So basically, you weren't allowed to carry anything heavier than a feather. And they would uh, not walk on grass. See, you can't walk on the grass during the Sabbath. Why? Because there might be a stalk of wild wheat uh, down there, and you might step on it and knock the grains loose, and thereby be guilty of harvesting. Oh, no. You know, it's just stuff like that. And it became more and more ridiculous, and it's just, it's just worse and worse. So when Jesus healed this man on the Sabbath, he, uh, the leadership was highly offended. This guy, this guy can't be the Messiah. He broke the Sabbath. Well, Jesus didn't break the Sabbath, not as the way it was written in the original, uh, original by Moses. The Sabbath he broke was the Sabbath they came up with, all the extra rules, and so they couldn't distinguish between the two, so he broke the Sabbath, but he didn't. Second Messianic miracle. The casting out of a mute or dumb demon. 
Now, when I say dumb demon, it doesn't mean you're stupid. Dumb is an old-fashioned term that means you can't talk. Uh, the implications of what's coming up here uh, really did change. This next account we're going to read really changed all of Jew Jewish history right up until today. It's, uh, it's, there's more to it than you, than you in can imagine. I'm going to Matthew 12, verses 22 through 37. A lot of verses here. Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind, and mute. He healed him, so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. He also, uh, and all the mu mu uh, multitudes were amazed, saying, Could this be the son of David? The multitudes get it. They're saying, This is the son of David. They're recognizing this guy is the Messiah. Now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? If I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? This, they, they had the ability to cast out demons. Therefore, they shall be your judges. If I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can you enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then he will plunder his house. He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Therefore, I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or the age to come. Either make a tree good and its fruit good, or a tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Fruit of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of good treasure uh, of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that every idle word men may speak, they will give an account on the, of it on the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. You know, at this point, even Jesus' friends are confused. They don't know what to think. Uh, Matthew 24, uh, 12, 24, the verse, we, one of the verses we just read contains a statement that sealed the fate of Israel for the last 2,000 years. When it said, now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the rulers of the demons. They're accusing Jesus of demonism. This was an official delegation from Jerusalem. These were the heavy hitters, and they were speaking for all of Israel. They deliver a negative decision reached by the Sanhedrin regarding his messianic claims. And this, this in the face of Jesus, performing yet another messianic miracle right in their presence. The act of casting out demons, as we've noted here earlier, was not all that unusual in the, in the, in the Jewish world of that day. Even Pharisees and rabbis had the ability to cast out demons. But the casting of demons within the framework of Pharisaic Judaism required one to use a specific ritual. First, the exorcist would uh, have to establish communication with the demon. For when a demon speaks, of course, uh, it, only use, it uses the vocal cords of the person they had to well. Second, communication was necessary to find out the demon's name. 
they could use that name to, ca to uh, use the demon's name to cast it out. And there's a case, uh, one case at least, of uh, Yeshua, Jesus, using this method. In Mark chapter 5, when Jesus is at the tombs, he's confronted by a demon-possessed man. Jesus asks him, what is your name? And he answers, uh, my name is Legion, for we are many. We had many demons. So the demons beg to be cast into a herd of pigs, and then a herd of pigs runs down a hill, and they jump in the lake, and they drown. What an awful waste of bacon. However, there is one kind of demon against which this method is useless. And that was the kind of demon that caused a person to be dumb or mute. The guy can't talk. He can't find out the demon's name. He can't cast it out. The rabbis had taught, however, that when Messiah comes, he'll be able to cast it out. In verse 23... Well, I mentioned the multitudes get it. Could this be the son, of the son of David? Which is the question that these things were intended, these miracles were intended to raise? This question never came up when Jesus did the wine, the wine thing, but uh, this was special. This was exactly what the rabbis had been teaching that the Messiah was going to do, and now everybody's confused because their leaders are telling them to reject this miracle worker. You know the problem the masses had? They had a total belief and trust in these, this leadership of Israel. You know, these guys had all the education. They had all the copies of the Torah, the scriptures that were available at that time. They had all the fancy clothes. They had all the money. They controlled the synagogues. They controlled the temple. You know, that was the center of the average Jew's life. They held all the cards. And they ruled with an iron fist. Nobody wanted to buck the system. When the Jewish uh, leadership declared Jesus to be demonically controlled, they sealed the fate of Israel and condemned the Jews to be scattered and under judgment for the next 2,000 years. Jesus issues the condemnation in verses 30 through 37. And Jesus said that this generation is guilty of the unpardonable sin, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, because the sin was exactly what he said it was, unpardonable. The judgment was set against this generation, no way out, and the judgment was, uh, was to be delivered 40 years later in AD 70. In AD 70, we had the destruction of Jerusalem, they had destruction of the temple. They, the Roman legions killed over a million people. Think about that. Over a million people murdered. The rest of Israel was scattered, and they remain scattered today. Just And for their entire history, the Jews have been persecuted and hated just like they are today. Yeah, there's... There is a partial regathering, but that's another subject for another day. The unpardonable sin is not an individual sin, but a national sin. It was committed by the Jewish generation of that day and cannot be applied to any subsequent generation. The context of the uh, unpardonable sin was the national rejection of the Messiahship of Yeshua while he was present on the grounds of demonism. Individuals could and did escape this judgment as like the thief on the cross. The thief on the cross is just one of the most classic examples. You know, nothing happens on the Bible on, on purpose. I think the thief on the cross is there to explain just how simple salvation is. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, he was uh, crucified between two criminals. He had one on the other side. First they harassed him. And, uh, and then after a while, one turns to him and says, Lord, when you go into your kingdom, remember me. He called him Lord. And what did Jesus say? He said, this day you will be with me in paradise. That man is in heaven today. He didn't get off the cross and go join a church. He didn't give any money to a church. He didn't do any rituals. He didn't get baptized. 
He didn't do the, he did no good works. He did nothing for his own salvation. All he could do was hang on that cross and say, Lord, forgive me and remember me. And he's in heaven today. You and I aren't hanging on crosses. None of us don't see anybody hanging on a cross here today, but we are all just as helpless to save ourselves as that man was 2,000 years ago. The only thing you can do is in your heart of hearts say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. Please save me. And that is what salvation is all about. It's purposely meant to be simple as can be, that anybody can do it. And if there's anybody here that hasn't ever take, done that for themselves, this is the day, because you never know how long it's going to be. Oh, where are we? I got off on a, on a rabbit trail. All right. The thief on the cross. Nor is this a sin that anyone can commit today. This was a national sin that was set in stone and took one generation, 40 years, before judgment was ex executed. You know, the thing I think of is like a, uh, a convicted criminal sentenced to the chair. You know, he's sentenced to the chair and he's back in jail. He's waiting his execution. You know, they usually give him a couple of appeals, but those after those are done, you're just waiting. There's this time lapse under which you're, what, you're waiting your judgment. And at, when he's in, at, at that point, he can say anything. He can beg and, bar and plead and say he's sorry. Nothing's going to help. You're going to, you're going to be executed. So... That's what you, Israel is under, and this, so that's why you can see that this is, we cannot be guilty. None of us here today can be guilty of the unpardonable sin. At any point that you're still alive, you know, you can turn to Jesus and ask for salvation. Of course, just don't wait till it's too late. There was one more consequence to this, uh, this uh, event. You know, that they were waiting all the Jews were waiting at that point, thinking the Messiah is going to come and he's going he's to kick out all the Romans and he's going to set up his kingdom. They were waiting for the kingdom. Well, the funny thing is, if they had accepted the Jesus as their Messiah, if they had actually turned and, and accepted Yeshua like they were supposed to, he was prepared to set up his kingdom. He would have set up his kingdom. But they rejected him, so the offer was withdrawn. It was withdrawn, and it will not be offered again until, as we read in Revelation, the end of, end of, end of the tribulation, the offer is going to be re-offered, re and they will upset, accept it. They will accept their Messiah, and that's when you get the thousand years of Jesus ruling and reigning from the temple. And that will be an awesome time. Uh, well, that's all the time we got to today. I didn't get to my, didn't get to go get to my third Miracle, but this actually was, this is intentional. This is a two-part, and the, the second part is going to be next month, like the first week of uh, December, Phil's going to be gone. And so I've got the second part of this, and there's actually a whole lot more. And uh, we're going to be getting into the third miracle, and we're going to be answering questions like, you know, there's a strange thing that Jesus did halfway through his ministry, at first, he was given clear teaching that people understood, like the Sermon on the Mount. And all of a sudden, halfway through his ministry, he teaches, he switches the teaching in parables. And for by his stated purpose, the parables were meant to hide the truth from the masses. Why would he do that? And then he starts telling his disciples, don't tell people I'm the Messiah. Don't tell people who I am. Why? Anyway, we've got a lot more good stuff, so I'll ask you to come back for part two. Here uh, the first week of December, Phil will be back next week, and uh, and uh, I think I can't remember. He's gonna is he finishing? He's gonna be finishing First uh, John. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for this, for this place of freedom and worship. We can come together and learn about you, Lord, and and Lord, we ask that you be with us as we go out into this this devil's world tomorrow, Lord, that we can be better witnesses for you today than we were today. Uh, Lord, that uh, you'll bring us opportunities to talk to people and, 
and hopefully explain some things that we may have learned today that uh, why they had miracles before and we don't have them now uh, you know just what what this was all about uh, Lord we just ask that you'll be with us and empower us to talk to our friends and family it's a dying world out there Lord and we need to be salt and light we need to be the light of this world for our friends and neighbors because uh, it's just a tragic idea that people that don't know ever come to know Jesus, what their end is. It's, it's horrific. Lord, we just thank you for all these people coming out here on a rainy day and, and ask you to uh, uh, strengthen us as a, more than just a church. It's more like a family, Lord, and help us to strengthen and, and empower and embolden our, each other. Uh, it's such a wonderful place, and, and we really do need each other. Uh, in these dark days. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Amen. Bob. All right, well, we're going to do a couple more worship songs, and um, we'll close out with one that you probably all know. Um, but we're going to do one now that uh, is a new one. You might know it, um, but if you don't... Um, um, you can try to sing along if you want to. If not, just um, just feel free to take some time and and um, just seek the Lord and pray and um, just uh, let your burdens down to Him just right now. Um, if you feel led to do that, um, or you can stand and, and sing and we'll just worship the Lord together.
can stop the Lord Almighty? And who can stop the Lord Almighty? And who can stop the Lord? And I got that day may be sooner than we think it may be later than we expect. I pray that you would help us to live as if it is today. That we would take the cares and the worries that come across us every day and we would surrender them to you. And in exchange, Jesus, you give us yourself. You are the sovereign God. Nothing frightens you. Nothing makes you stay up at night. Nothing makes you worry. Lord, I pray for the people here right now, God, who are just whose hearts are hurting. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe it's the loss of a loved one, um, regrets, or all many different kinds of sins that can just come back to haunt us, or mistakes that we've made. Jesus, I pray that you would just meet them where they're at. You would show yourself strong and gracious. Show yourself willing to forgive. Lord, you are very patient with us, and we thank you very much for that. Pray that you would make us more aware um, of just seeing you work in our daily lives. You do so much that we don't even pay attention to or give you credit for. Lord, show us that you desire a personal relationship with us, not just us coming to church or, or doing the right things or saying the right things. No matter how good we think we are, no matter how far we think that we've uh, strayed, no one is out of your reach. Thank you, Lord, for your love. We ask for your blessing. Um, As we leave here today, Lord, I pray that you would help us to all return home safely and that we would remember the truth of your word that was taught today and that we would dig in the scriptures ourselves. We'd make it real between us and you. And thank you so much for your presence here today. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. And we're going to do one more and uh, we'll just close with a blessing. So um, you're welcome, of course, to stay seated or standing. Um, just worship the Lord. are your tabernacle glory to the Lord on high and God of wonders beyond our galaxy you 
Wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy, holy, precious Lord. Reveal your heart to me, and Father. bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. As he shines upon you, let him shine in and through and out of you so that wherever you go, people will see Jesus, the light of the world.